everyone to this group discussion uh, on alternative form of protest. Um, I work at the Center of African Studies here at SOAS. I'm very pleased to introduce these great speakers, which I want to thank very much for taking part in this roundtable, and who will help us understand a bit more about what's happening in some areas of the continent and what implication, both lo locally and globally, these experiences of alternative form of protest can have. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention at the beginning that uh, this panel has been kind of the result of a joint effort with the Royal African Society and in particular with Kaylin Pearson who is, was supposed to be the co-chair but she's doing camera and <laughs> next time we'll swap. Um, uh, and James Wan as well um, to explore this theme and we hope this is the beginning of a longer series of future debates and research um, around this topic. Um, so this is a bit more informal, as you can see, like compared to the rest of, of the panel discussion, because we kind of wanted the, the, the audience to participate a bit more. Um, um, we'll try to keep our kind of um, intervention. Intervention? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> uh, more brief, uh, so then we can just like have a have a more interesting discussion with everyone. Because I know people in the audience as well have a lot of interesting um, experiences or or case studies that they can bring also to the discussion. Um, first of all, I would just like to to welcome Dr. Jenny Fatumbai from City University of London, who kindly agreed to join us at very short notice. I'm very grateful for. She's a lecturer in culture and creative industries, and her research interest focuses <coughs> on uh, urban popular music and cultural economies in Francophone West Africa. She will bring in um, the perspective of musicians and artists and their role in fostering um, alternative form of protest, and will expand on, on, on this. Uh, then I'd like to introduce Nanjala Nyobala who some of you might have already heard speaking or chairing, actually chairing the last panel, so <laughs> thanks for running from one panel to the other. Um, she's a writer and researcher from Kenya with particular interest in politics and social media, marginalized voices and gender. You might have heard her speaking at the, at the group discussion on knowledge uh, production already about some of these topics on social media and their importance especially in Kenya. So she will bring this idea of uh, the impact of social media in triggering and organizing alternative form of protest. Uh, professor Stephen Chan, of course, is our in-house professor <laughs> of the international <laughs> development um, uh, in the um, politics and international relations department here at SOAS, uh, honorary professor visiting and fellow in many other universities across Europe and uh, Southern Africa. And he, he will be key in anchoring our discussion sort of with a historical perspective in order to understand the continuities and discontinuities within the process of protesting um, across the continent. Uh, last but not least, on my left, let me introduce you uh, James Wan, journalist and the editor of the Royal African Society website or blog, do you say website or blog? What do you prefer? Website. I got it right. <laughs> African Arguments. Um, he was previously acting editor of African Business Magazine and senior editor <coughs> of Think Africa Press. Uh, James will have the responsibility to kick off the discussion, uh, presenting a sort of general overview of some of the most interesting alternative form of protest that have been happening on the continent in the recent years. So, over to you. Cool, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to try and uh, describe a few forms of alternative protest to you know, get the discussion going. Um, so I think that m most typically when we think of protest, at least in the West, we tend to think of uh, things like people <coughs> taking to the streets, throwing placards, chanting slogans. <coughs> um, we might also think of kind of sit-ins and strikes and active civil disobedience. Um, and often the kind of call to arms is, you know, stand up and be counted and make your voice heard. Um, but in many places, that's not really feasible. So particularly in repressive regimes, public demonstrations can bring very real and immediate personal risks. Um, and there are many countries, particularly in Africa and in Asia, where you know, security forces are not at all afraid to use violence against protesters, um, and where being known to be a dissident can 
be dangerous not just to oneself but to one's friends and family. Um, moreover, there are many indicators that suggest the civic space on the continent and in the world more generally is, is shrinking. Um, there are many governments that are kind of increasingly clamping down on freedoms of association, of assembly, and of speech. Uh, and this makes, I suppose, what you could call more like traditional forms of protest more, more costly and more risky. Um, but there's a whole variety of strategies through which it's possible to protest, um, through which it's possible to show dissent, to push for change, to cultivate solidarity, and to kind of broaden the political imagination. Um, now the kind of theory of change behind them, the, the, the audience, the type of engagement of those involved might be slightly different to uh, marches and public demonstrations, but I think they fulfill and aim at the same goals of kind of opposition, of solidarity and change. Um, and as Anna said, in the last few years in Africa at least, there's been a really wide range of kind of very interesting and creative strategies that have been employed. Um, and some have used kind of new technologies and digital spaces that Manjali can talk a lot more about. Um, some of these kind of cultural forms that Jenny can talk much more about. Um, but some have simply relied on kind of low cost kind of creative thinking. Um, these might not have the same immediacy as, say, marches and might not garner the same kind of coverage. Um, but I think they're really important in, in understanding what protest is and what it can be in very difficult environments. Um, so I thought to flesh that out, I'd present kind of four examples, four specific examples of these kinds of protests. Um, one from Chad, from Benin, one from kind of all over, and one from Ethiopia to kind of paint the picture. Um, so the first that I wanted to present is uh, came from Chad. So last year, around the 2016 elections, people wanted to kind of mobilise to insist on free and fair elections and also protest against what they saw as injustice, nepotism, and impunity. Uh, at the same time, in the, in the months leading up to the election, the government was kind of ramping up its strategies of oppression and its restrictions on freedoms of speech and assembly. Um, so one campaign group came up with the idea of what they called the citizen whistle. Um, uh, the citizen whistle. Um, and what they did was they called on people to get up at 4.30 in the morning and go into their courtyards or lean out of their windows and just whistle as loudly as they could for 15 minutes. <laughs> um, and then they did a similar thing at a very specific time, 15 minutes in the evening. And actually a few years previously, campaigners had organized similar protests, but it had been kind of banging together pots and pans rather than whistling. Um, so the, for the people involved, um, particularly in kind of the towns and cities, this was meant to be a kind of emboldening experience. It was symbolically a powerful challenge. It was a way to demonstrate the extent of their discontentment in kind of no uncertain terms. But at the same time, it was low risk, it was safe, it was anonymous to an extent. Um, people didn't even need to leave their homes. Um, the second alternative protest strategy uh, is from Benin. So in 2013, there were many indications that President Yayi Boni wanted to amend the constitution to, to remove term limits. Um, so a group of campaigners came up with what they called the Red Wednesday movement. Um, and they called on people who disagreed with the president's plans to just wear bright red every Wednesday. Um, sometimes this was accompanied by traditional protests that people would, would also march on the streets. Um, but many people just wore red on that day to show support. Some would wear it more kind of surreptitiously to show support in a more kind of subtle way. Um, and again, this was a way to kind of to build solidarity, to build momentum in a kind of sustainable way. It was visible, it was collective, but it was also kind of low cost and low risk. Um, the third example may be kind of more immediately familiar, and it's uh, more like a ghost town or shut down or be mort in French. Um, and that's when people are encouraged to just stay at home for the day to express their discontent. Um, so from street vendors to uh, civil servants to minibus drivers, um, the idea is that everyone just stays at home and brings the whole city to a halt um, and kind of render the streets empty. And this has been done, this strategy has really kind of spread quite far and wide in the last couple of years and has been uh, conducted in 
several places, particularly in kind of repressive regimes. Um, so just in the last kind of year or so, <coughs> these have been attempted to varying degrees of success in uh, Congo Kinshasa, Congo Brazzaville, Zimbabwe, Madagascar, Ethiopia, Chad, Nigeria, and I'm sure other places as well. Um, and this strategy is high impact both economically and that it brings everything uh, to a halt, but also symbolically. Uh, again, it's a necessarily collective endeavor and sends a strong message of dissent, but in many ways it totally kind of inverts the more traditional forms of protest. So you're showing dissent and you're showing solidarity through your absence rather than through your presence. Um, and again, it's low cost, it's low risk, and to an extent it's anonymous. Um, the fourth and final strategy I wanted to describe that I think really shows the diversity of possibilities is from Ethiopia. Uh, so for the last few years, there have been tensions between the government and the Muslim community um, who accuse the government of kind of interfering in religious affairs, of maltreatment, of marginalization. And there have been a number of demonstrations in which security forces have uh, violently repressed <coughs> the demonstrators and several Muslim leaders have been imprisoned. So it was in this, this kind of environment in 2015 um, that a group decided to call on people. They came up with this kind of innovative strategy and they told people basically to just stop spending coins. They told people to not use coins but to just hoard them. Um, and the idea was that this would take a lot of cash out of circulation. Um, and the people behind it kind of disagreed on what the exact economic effects of this would be. Um, but the idea was that it was something that could be done collectively in solidarity, anonymously and safely, but still was being kind of disruptive and subversive. Um, so, yeah, so I think this bunch of examples kind of shows the diversity of ways in which it's possible to do the things that protest aims to do, cultivating solidarity, pushing for change, demonstrating opposition, and broadening the political imagination. Um, and for me, it kind of raises certain questions that um, hopefully we can kind of discuss afterwards, which are things like, you know, to what extent are these alternative protest strategies, um, to what extent do they have impact in of themselves, and to what extent are they useful in that they cultivate the kind of conditions that allow for more traditional protests that may still be necessary to actually push for change. Um, another question I have is how quickly kind of protesters can innovate. Um, it feels like kind of as civil space shrinks, people find little gaps and exploit them. Um, but governments are always uh, finding ways to close those gaps and have far more resources than most protesters. Um, and will it always be possible to find these kind of existing spaces of, of civic space? Um, the final question I have is kind of how, whether we should think of these as like alternative and new forms. Um, and see them as a kind of novel response to, to today's conditions, or whether there have always been these more kind of peculiar forms of protest, but they've just not been given as much attention. Um, and if that's the case, you know, what can African protesters today learn from kind of historical examples? Um, and also more broadly, what can African protesters both teach and learn from protesters beyond the continent? Thank you so much. Um, address some of the issues that maybe James brought up uh, and also talk about starting with uh, the role of social media. Because um, you were mentioning already yesterday yeah. that, 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 that there's been already some uh, cases of impact that yeah. Twitter has triggered some movement that has brought to lows. Yeah. So maybe you can... Um, maybe not necessarily a direct response, but yeah, no, um, I think that one of the, okay, so the movement that I wanted to talk about today is a movement that I mentioned yesterday, my dress, my choice movement, because I think it really signals, um, A, how people can either over or underestimate the impact that digital spaces will have on life offline. Um, in Kenya, we, we tend to be, just like many other places, people tend to be very disparaging of digital spaces, of Twitter warriors. There's all this hashtag, what they call hashtag heroes and Twitter warriors, and there's, there's a whole, um, lexicon of derogatory terms for people who do their activism online, and it's very easy to underestimate what's possible. 
At the same time, it's very easy to overestimate what is possible. And um, I think the My Dress, My Choice movement shows how very key strategic decisions within movement building can actually be used to capitalize and to turn something that is an online conversation into a real cultural moment and a political moment. Um, the My Dress, My Choice movement it has roots in feminism. And in Kenya, feminism has always been a dirty word. Um, to identify yourself, to self-identify as a feminist, certainly in my lifetime, and definitely in my mother's lifetime, um, was to just basically say you're a man-hater, you hate traditional marriage, you hate everything about um, you know, heteronormative lifestyle. If you're a horrible person, go stand in the corner and think about what you've done. Um, <laughs> and I certainly grew up believing that feminism was a terrible, terrible thing, because we were told that this thing was disrupting the way in which African societies are supposed to function. And um, you know some of our greatest heroines, Mogar Mbaye, very powerful, very overt feminism, widely disparaged in Kenya. When she came back after receiving the Nobel Prize, nobody went to the airport um, to welcome her back. You know, so there's this real disconnect between um, the fact that Kenyan women are strong and are very represented in public and political life, but struggle to self-identify with this label that's very much associated with the radical feminism of the West in the 60s and in the 70s. Um, so what has what has social media done for Kenyan feminism? It's a made it cool to be a feminist because suddenly you have all these young women who are being very visible and very vocal about their feminism and being very active in public life and wearing that brand confidently. And the more cool it has become to be a feminist, the more young women have wanted to identify with the label. And then at the same time, it's allowed these women who have maybe previously felt isolated. Um, when I say that I'm a feminist in my household, I certainly get a lot of flack for that. Um, I have two older brothers whom I love, but um, yeah. Um, and and um, you know my high school classmates who are strong, independent, very well driven, you know. With intelligent women who have achieved a lot in their personal professional life would, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't take on that label. And then suddenly I'm online and I'm tweeting about feminism and someone in Mombasa says, hey, I'm a feminist too, let's talk to each other. What social media did is it made it possible for women who identify this way to reach out and communicate with each other and build a digital community in a, a space in which it would not have been possible to do that offline. It would not have been possible for us to be having these conversations offline. And so, um, and then the other thing is that, um, something that James um, alluded to is the constraints that make it impossible to organize offline. Um, it is very difficult for women to organize offline in Kenya for various reasons. Um, the movement, the social movements that were initially put in place in the 50s and the 60s, the Mandalay and Wanawake movement, the, um, the, the Beijing uh, uh, 1985 conference that also led to a, a form of organization, were all appropriated by power. So Mandalay and Wanawake was supposed to be this movement for, for it, it literally means progress for women, um, was actually subsumed by the ruling party during the one party rule era and became the unofficial, kind of like the mother's union of the one party state. And that meant that women who want, and, and, it became, and then it became all about these developmental narratives. It became about women as mothers of the nation and women as, you know, your job is to protect the family and preserve the family and do all of these things. And, you know, in a young country, 60% um, of Kenyans below the age of 35 most women are not mothers. And there's no space for young women within this developmental narrative to express their fullness of their existence because it's like, well, I'm not a mother. Um, some of us don't want to be mothers, but some people do, but are not mothers yet. So how do I express my feminism and my pride and my identity as a woman in this developmental sort of captured um, um, mechanism? And so what, again, what online spaces have done is that they've made it possible for young women especially to create networks of support, of dialogue, of discourse away from this developmental captured um, um, discourse. 
And so now you can be a feminist and be a quote-unquote cool feminist, and you're, you're not a mother, you're not, it's not that you're, you hate motherhood, but it's not something that you are yet, or maybe will ever be, or if you're a gay woman, maybe you're not interested in, in, in you know, heteronormative family structures, but you can exist, and you can be proud of who you are, and you can talk to other people who are living in the same, who are existing in the same framework. And so online spaces have made Kenyan feminism possible in a way that offline spaces have struggled to comprehend. There is no space for me as a radical feminist to publish in the Kenyan newspaper about what I think about, um, you know, appending patriarchal structures. There's no editor in the Kenyan newspaper who will touch that part. <laughs> like, they wouldn't even touch it. What are you talking about? Meanwhile, you have women who can write, like Joki Chege is a famous commenter, and she wrote an entire article about how Twitter feminists are dirty and disgusting. She hates our natural hair. She thinks we should all get weaves. She literally said this, and it was published in one of the best selling newspapers in the country, and it went viral. Because that's, and that's what you're up against. So what social media has done for Kenyan feminism is, is important. It's beyond hashtag heroes and, and, and online you know, warriors and all of that. It's made it possible to build a community. And this is what the My Dress My Choice movement builds up on. Um, it's not a new thing, it has happened. Every time we, are, we have very serious political turmoil in Kenya, violence against women spikes, and public violence against women. So it happened in the early 90s, it happened again in 1997 when we had the economic collapse, it happened again in 2012, after 2013, after the previous election. Um, Kenya has always been one of the more conservative, certainly Christian country, societies in Africa. Um, I didn't notice, I noticed this when I started to travel. And, you know, I go to Madagascar and I see women walking around the streets of Tanarivo in hot pants and sleeveless tops. You can't do that in Nairobi. It's always been a very socially conservative society. And um, we, sometimes people, men, take it upon themselves to be the enforcers. We don't have a, a morality police like in Saudi Arabia, but sometimes men, young men especially, take it upon themselves to enforce this unspoken moral code. And so in this period that I've mentioned, what tends to happen is a young woman will go into the central business district of Nairobi or in Mombasa or wherever, wearing a sleeveless top or, you know, not even a mini skirt, like a short skirt, and she will, be a victim. she will be assaulted, she will be stripped publicly, stripped publicly, and you know, called a prostitute, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and go back and get dressed and whatever. And um, you know, fashion has ways, periods. And so in my lifetime, I can say we went from super conservative, people pushing the boundaries, pushing the boundaries, because again, Kenya is, Nominally uh, secular state, predominantly a Christian uh, society, um, in the sense that there is no cultural, written cultural code about dress. It's all just codes that people kind of know. When you come to Kenya and you ask me, um, can I wear my, my uh, cut off jeans, I would probably say, no, you probably shouldn't do that. It's not something that's written down anywhere. But anyway, so. Um, as people started in the in the 2000s, people started women, young women especially, started to push the boundaries of what people thought dress code wise was possible in public spaces. The central business district is also a very formal space. Um, think about Nairobi as a racial. Nairobi has a history as a racially segregated uh, city. The central business district is the only place where everybody meets, and it's a formal space. Men wear suits when they go to town. We say going to town. Men wear suits. Um, you don't wear flip-flops. Um, if I wore these shoes, I would probably get eye rolls, but I don't care because I love my Converse trainers. Um, and so this is the space in which women started to push the boundaries and started to wear the sleeveless tops and the dresses got a little bit shorter as fashion became more risque. Um, and in 2013, 2000, yeah, 2013, we had this really interesting uh, phenomenon whereby <laughs> Suddenly, you started to hear the stripping became a thing again. And they started to tell women, don't wear this, don't wear that. In the past, women would have said, would have actually gone back and said, I'm not going to wear that because that's not acceptable. But there was one incident, um, I, I write about this in my research, where Ring White called her wearing to protect her privacy, where the story came out that she had been dressed in a certain way and therefore was assaulted. 
And so the narrative had already started that, yeah, women shouldn't dress like this, women shouldn't dress like this. But actually on deeper investigation, what had happened is this woman was selling eggs, you know, boiled eggs as a snack, and this matatu tout had taken the egg and refused to pay for it. And she told him that he had to pay for it. She insisted that he had to pay for it. And he started to call her a prostitute, and he hit her. And then the other men, thinking that it was because of the way she was dressed, jumped in, and she was stripped, and she was so badly beaten, she ended up in hospital. And her sister was also there trying to protect her, and she got beaten, but she didn't. Uh, um, when Rima went into a, a coma, um, the other lady was just badly beaten and didn't. And so this triggered this massive um, debate online especially. Because there were 50, I would say 50% of people, mostly men, saying, yeah, women shouldn't go out dressed like this. But suddenly, for the first time, you had women who had been organizing over a number of years, you know, uh, this online conversation saying, screw that. Sh women should be able to wear whatever they want. And, and s there was this pushback, this co conversation between these two. And, uh, you know, one of the most prominent male bloggers in Kenya tweeted out and said, if you come into my house dressed indecently, best believe I will be the first to strip you. This guy has 600,000 followers on, on Twitter. Um, and so, my dress, my choice, basically, this organized movement of women started the hashtag to say, actually women should be able to, do, to wear whatever they want in the spaces that they occupy. It started from a small conversation on Facebook. It became a hashtag on both Facebook and Twitter. And then it led to an <laughs> offline march that took over the Central Business <coughs> District, in which women of all religions, all ages, all whatever, showed up and said, even I, you know, and there's a powerful picture that you can find online, even I, as a conservative Muslim woman in a jalbab, believe that my Christian women, you know, compatriots should be able to wear whatever they want. It was like a very representative of the religious, ethnic, um, political diversity of Kenyan women. And so they had the protest all, all, offline, and then also <coughs> really just relentlessly harassed the deputy public prosecutor online and just tweeted at him, prosecute, 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 prosecute. We're not going to let this go. And what happened? Number one, the laws on assault were reinforced. So the deputy public prosecutor, the House of Parliament could not ignore this movement and said, hey, we actually need to tighten these laws up. And so if you strip a woman in public in Kenya today, there's a penalty um, that in the past, in the 1997 wave of stripping, the 1992 wave of stripping was never enforced. It was always the woman's fault that she was dressed a certain way and therefore she quote unquote deserved to be the violence that she endured. So the law was enforced. There was a case, the decision came down yesterday, the day before yesterday. Um, I don't agree with the decision and I'll tell you because I am against carceriality because they gave them the death penalty. And while I do think assault is very serious, and I think the courts should take it seriously, I think giving someone the death penalty is a disproportionate use of force by the state. And um, yeah, so there's a whole other ethics about that. But the point that I would make in this framework is the combination of being able to shame public institutions on online spaces and to compel them to respond in a way that wasn't possible 10 years ago. That's something that's really important and that people are really harnessing in Kenya right now. We're getting people to react. And if you go online, you see um, what is a road. is a campaign where people take pictures of potholes <coughs> in Nairobi and they tag the mayor and the, the governor and say, what is a road, you know? And that's a whole thing that's, that's uh, forcing the, the, the county council to respond. Um, it ties into something that James said. There's also the risk factor. A bunch of women, I as a feminist woman, I have, I've actually done this in my lifetime. I've organized a protest where nobody else showed up. I sat outside parliament with my placard. <laughs> when I got heat stroke, it was really hot. And um, <laughs> I'm going to ask you to I'm wrap gonna, up. I'm wrapping up. I'm wrapping up. Yeah. I'm wrapping up. Um, it's scary. But what it's done is that it's made it less scary. Because there's suddenly there's other people who will show up, even if there's 12 of us and then if there's 13 of us. 
And to me, that's really important, and that's a real, that's why, that's what, the, what the energy I'm trying to capture in my research is, yeah, social media doesn't make a movement, but it's become really important in shape. Jenny, if you want to bring in a bit the, um, the aspect of artists and musicians in the in the discussion. So first of all, thank you for for having me. It's uh, all the joining at the late stage. It's a pleasure to hear all these different perspectives. And, um, I shall be speaking from uh, an experience of someone who's looking to cultural entrepreneurs in um, specific urban culture, which is hip hop especially in Francophone West Africa, and especially more particularly in, in Senegal. And so to the question that you raised at the end of your, of your, uh, of your intervention, whether we're talking about new forms of protest, and to the comments that you made regarding the impossibility of uh, prisons offline, or actually the great challenge that it can represent, what I'm what, what, what I can share with you is quite conventional in a way. Um, we have in Senegal a relatively active civil society, uh, a, a space where civil society can express itself. And one of the most um, crucial moments uh, in our recent history where that has been expressed is during the 23rd, uh, uh, it, during the last presidential election, not the one coming up now, now, but the one before, where um, uh, the then president what tried to, you know, juggle with the constitution, making sure that his son would be able to take his throne. Fortunately, we are in a democracy, and so um, this didn't skip the attention of um, artists, especially hip hop artists. So here, I'm very much interested in this intersection between politics, um, polit a political culture, which is very much present in um, um, a, a type of uh, urban cultural expression that is about negotiating identities, but that, that is also very much about speaking truth to power. Um, in its variegated forms, whether it's um, talking about the Senegalese case or elsewhere. And in this, in, in this uh, experience of the 23rd of June and the group, emergent group Yonama, um, we had the affirmation of uh, new actors on the political sphere, people who used to denounce and contest and protest through lyrics through songs, but who suddenly felt the need to take those songs, lyrics, into another space, which was a street space, which was outside and which was offline. And that, that really resonated with the majority of the population, who really joined the forces. You could see um, you know, from across generations uh, marching, and it wasn't peaceful. It was, there, 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 there was some, uh, uh, obviously, altercations. But it managed to stop what was to be about a breach of the civil rights and of the, of the democracy. We have all those forms, and again, still looking at hip hop artists um, in, in Senegal, but also elsewhere in, 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 on the African continent, um, of this. Um, political figure that is the artist. I was very, very touched this morning for the intervention that reminded uh, of the importance of uh, arts, cultural production, um, such as film as a tool to change the continent or art being at the heart of, uh, of a nation, not just about entertainment. And why I focus so much on this new generation of cultural actors, cultural entrepreneurs, is because they were expressing this in different ways. So in very explicit and conventional ways, as the example of Yon Amar, but also in more um, subtile ways. For instance, where in 2013, the development of um, internet product that was the wrapped TV news by two uh, hip hop artists, pioneer hip hop artists, who've been very vocal and volatile uh, about uh, the, the political sphere uh, uh, and the democracy 
and the, the role of uh, citizens and their place in, in, the, in, in the nation. Um, and this is uh, Human and Katie, who developed this five minute section uh, on uh, Internet First, where they were debating in, um, um, in a vernacular that was approachable, that was accessible to the majority of the population. Um, the current news, current affairs of a country and beyond. Um, and this is where, it's, so since then, this, this internet product was taken for, uh, onto the uh, national TV, it was transformed into a live performance that toured, and they're now starting their fourth, um, their fourth um, edition, their fourth season, season thank you. Um, what leads me, by looking at this last example, uh, to maybe try to conclude, wrap up, because I've been sent the signal and I have so much to share, so I need to um, control, self-control. Um, <laughs> um, it's a form of, maybe if I dare to say it, a form of everyday activism, or everyday forms of protest, so protest that takes shape in an everyday practice. I give you an example. We are in Senegal in a context where, for instance, art and culture don't benefit from an appropriate policy framework that anchorage, that supports a form of protest which I found and that, that, that really attract my attention and maybe uh, that I would like to um, understand as agent or cultural agent of transformation, of change, not necessarily development. I think we need at some point to also step out of this uh, taking for granted term. But to my transformers, we all had the, this uh, cartoon at some point, maybe, you remember? <laughs> my cultural transformers, those who on every day make daily protests through their actions, through their identities. So examples speak better. I give you the example of the Africulture Band. Africulture Band, which is a youth center that is located in the periphery of uh, Dakar in the popular neighborhood of Peking, which uh, took place in a depleted uh, center of the city and which was reappropriated, reinvested by first a hip hop artist, Matador, uh, who decided that, well, we are citizens, this is uh, uh, an institution uh, of the state, so supposedly for us, let's talk about public service, if it's really what we are talking about. And so if they don't take action, maybe we can, you know, refurbish it, it was literally a trash space, so let's like, so clean it, empty it, and reinvest it, and ten years later they created a library, they created the first DJ in school, they created a festival that celebrated its 13th edition, and they created a space for the use as it was supposed to be. What is interesting, uh, and that's where I'm making this, this link, um, is that last year a similar uh, uh, organization, similar structure emerged in the, s in the core of the city of Dakar, a Maison des Cultures Urbaines, MC, so the House of Urban Cultures, which was kind of a replicate of what this institution created by active, informed, concerned citizen, um, but at the initiative of, uh, of the mayor who recognized the added value of those agents of change, those cultural creative transformers. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I, okay, I need to end here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, you can minute ago, but. <laughs> okay, so. Can uh, I, yeah. No, no, do you want to. So may, may, maybe one, 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 one final point here is that we may also be inclined to recognize, if we're talking about governance, if we're talking about language and the capacity to speak to different communities, political, artistic, uh, the, the everyday, everyday citizen, we may need to also look at. Uh, the role of civil society in um, and its social responsibility and its capacity to not only speak back but explain to our public servant, to our, uh, to our public institutions uh, how they can intervene in a sector, how they can approach the sector. And I think they are key in doing and occupying this function 
in uh, the sphere of culture and arts and creativity at the urban level. I stop there. And <laughs> We, we heard about offline, online um, uh, influence. If you have to say it from an historical perspective, do you see an evolution that something has changed or are we going back to square one? Or well, both, both. There's certainly been an evolution, particularly with electronic means. You can't deny that. But it's very inchoate and it's very uneven. And it's a mixture of both old means and modern means in today's protest. But just to riff off uh, the last point, I mean, music has already and always been part of protest, or at least of symbolic defiance. So in 1955, for instance, on the eve of the Freedom Charter Congress of the People in Soweto in South Africa, you know, the presentation of Louis Armstrong's trumpet to Cuba Bakela, a jazz solidarity across continents was recognized by the people who convened as the Congress of the People uh, to sign the Freedom Charter as a major act of solidarity and defiance. There were no words in the jazz of that day. It was very, very much an instrumental form of expression, but very much an e expression that was in contradiction to received forms of structured, more classical Western music. And amazingly, creative things came out of the Southern African jazz experience. I mean, Skokia, which has simply become one of the great jazz classics, was actually composed in Bulawayo, in what is now Zimbabwe, uh, by a local Bulawayo musician. And that was taken very, very much as symbolic. But I wouldn't over-egg this, so that almost everyone here would know the music of Kofi Olamide, for instance. When you translate some of the vernacular lyrics, he's selling advertising space to political figures that we would deem reprehensible. <laughs> Kofi's going through a bad financial moment. He needs the cash. Mm. This can work both ways. Mm. So don't forget that, again, if you look at the experience in Zimbabwe right now, where you have a spin doctor who's often out of favor, sometimes in favor, with Robert Mugabe, very often regarded as the Goebbels, or at least as the Peter Nagelsen, <coughs> of Zimbabwean <Zimbabwe> politics, <coughs> a gentleman called Jonathan Moyo, who owes me a lot of money, <coughs> from the days when he was a democratic uh, <coughs> academic. His ability to manipulate media is legendary. <coughs> when we talk about the advent of electronic and uh, social media means of protest, then it works both ways. And I think it's very, very dangerous to take certain examples of African protests and say, well, this becomes a model for the whole continent. The 55 bloody countries yeah. and the very, very different conditions. So that we often talk very lazily, in my opinion, about Tahrir Square and the Egyptian uprising at the height of the Arab Spring as a social media revolution. It was partly that. We can't deny that. That was very, very much evident in part. But very, very much what was also at play in Egypt was the huge density and configuration of the city, the huge critical mass of the population that could be convened, the great difficulty once they had convened of sending an armored military or police units to disperse them, and all kinds of things to do with underground organization, not only of the Muslim Brotherhood, but of the university sector, which is simply not able to be replicated in other jurisdictions. You put that combination together, and it becomes an impossible, I stress that, impossible model of protest to replicate anywhere else in Africa. So I want to stress that every single situation is unique. Not only that, but when you've got opposition parties in different parts of Africa, who in some ways think history has stopped still, uh, so that they actually haven't learned how to mobilize their own supporters by new forms of social media. And Zimbabwe is very much a case in point. Uh, that what you've got are people trying to mobilize themselves, perhaps through electronic means, without a core message that is blessed by the opposition party who they may wish to support. Where you've got this disjunction that we must loosely call civil society and organized formal political forces 
it doesn't work. That conjuncture is not made quite explicit. There's nobody in Morgan Chandler Rice Cats who actually understands how this stuff works. There's everybody in Robert Mugabe's camp who does. And they're not worried about this because what they've got is command in particular of vernacular radio. Uh, that's their messaging to the rural areas where vernacular radio will still have far more penetration and reach, for instance, than forms of social media that depend on the internet. It leads me to the point that when we do talk about this revolution of the internet, it is a very, very dangerous one for generalizations. Africa Report, a French magazine for which I write, now does in its annual survey not only the normal indices of development like GDP, per capita income, level of literacy, and that kind of thing, which is standard now, but cell phone penetration. Okay, now that's a very, very indicative measure. When you go through their list of countries on their annual tables, the levels of difference between cell phone penetration in one country and cell phone penetration in another can be astounding. But even that can be misleading. Because what you want to do is to marry those statistics with web coverage. No good having a smartphone where you can't get decent coverage, for instance. So even in Southern Africa, you've got Zimbabwe, which is actually wired up very, very well. Better than South Africa to the south, and better than Zambia in the north. You've got actually an electronic space which is capable of messaging in a very profound way, but which is not taken advantage of by a professional political class in the opposition. So that the very, very great breakthrough in the 2008 2013 elections in Zimbabwe, which Mugabe won again. Uh, and the book on that came out last week, Cambridge uh, University Press, do buy now, I, I need the royalties. <laughs> Describing exactly how uh, the ruling party, Mr. Mugabe, did it, by both fair means as well as foul. It's all not just one way. Fair means also requires very good <coughs> judicious use of modern means of communicating. But the interesting electronic opposition to the Robert Mugabe drive for the election in 2013 actually came from dissidents in his own party. It wasn't from the official opposition. We've pretty much narrowed this down to people in the circle of Joyce Mujuru, who was at that point in time Robert Mugabe's deputy president. She's now been thrown out of the party and is one of the opposition leaders in a very fractured opposition. But they put online on Facebook uh, a cartoon character called Baba Chukwa. And Baba Chukwa basically posted many posts every single day. Just a cartoon figure. No one actually worked out at the time of the election just who he was. But the amount of inside information that he was leaking of Mugabe's party's electoral plans and policies uh, bespoke the fact that here was an insider deliberately leaking. And if they could be taken advantage of by equally sophisticated means by the opposition, and what you would have had would have been the building up of a body of knowledge which would have been used to counteract government propositions, policies, and party platforms through the election. But that was not taken advantage of. What you've got in South Africa is something which is even more primitive. This we really did stop at the moment of liberation in 1994. More than half of President Zuma's cabinet, most of President Mbeki's cabinet, and almost none of President Mandela's cabinet could use email. To this day, more than half of President Zuma's cabinet can't use email. My estimates are that something like 40% of municipal public administration is not anchored in electronic communication. They get as far as text messaging. You've got all these fantastically beautiful smartphones and all they can do the send texts on this. And of course the joke in South Africa is that I'm a scientist with very heavy data to transmit to my colleagues at the university at the other end of the country. By the time it downloaded on my colleague's screen on the other end of the country, it's actually faster for me to have sent it as a memory stick tied to the carrier pigeon. <laughs> we tried that once, it's true. <laughs> so even the most sophisticated seeming environments, if you are not able to grapple with modernity, if you're not able to utilize it and have on command the infrastructure, 
that makes modernity work. All you're going to be talking about is isolated incidents. So, okay, now I'll leave you with the old fashioned kind of protest, which is still very, very popular. Be caught in the middle of a lot of this. It's not attractive. If any of you have been out on the streets of Europe and you've been water cannoned or tear gas, okay, let me give you an indication. The tear gas we use here in Europe is a very, very polite form of tear gas. We call that tier three. Mm -hmm. And that will leave you feeling quite sick and nauseous, but you're going to live. And you've got stories to tell at your dinner time for many, many moons afterwards about how brave you were and you're coughing and spluttering and crying for a very short period of time. Grade A tear gas made primarily by the North Koreans and the Israelis. It's very hard to tell the difference in terms of potency. Uh, both are just as nasty as the other. I just get it absolutely incapacitated. And there's nothing you're going to be able to do with, no matter how many wet towels you're going to carry around to kind of contract it, no matter how thick your diver's goggles are that you're putting on, you're just going to go down. It's going to take very brave citizens to go out and face that when the crank is really on. So when we talk about social media as a palliative, an alternative, some kind of substitute for bravery in the streets, we're not here there. We're not here there. When we're talking about protests, we are still in an era where we're not going to talk about just straightforward bravery in the streets.
Uh, you are. Actually. So tell some people that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, this is a very relative. Uh, so I just want to more highlight. I mean, I mean the uh, it's different. Sometimes I mean, people get into creative and innovative way of protest to yield more results, to be to be more effective. But in a country like Ethiopia, where there were numerous religious, political, uh, ethnic, uh, and national protests, most of them complementing each other, because uh, like the government, they have to uh, invent new ways of protests. Because I mean, there was days, there was torture and uh, imprisonment. I just want to highlight that. I probably will try to respond to some of the other because I think they're, they're touching the same thing. Um, I think people are innovating because the space is shrinking and because going out in the streets is becoming extremely um, um, economically, personally, physically expensive. Um, people are getting killed. And um, I think that um, to, try to respond to the question about you know, the shrinking space, this is me being radical feminist. Um, capitalism needs an exploited class. There has to be an underclass of people to make things cheaply that we consume cheaply. And what's happening right now is that African governments, African states, are producing a lot of the people who make up this exploited class. I mentioned to the question to the American yesterday about um, the young men and women who are dying in the Mediterranean Sea right now who are considered surplus in their own countries. Um, those young men and women are not leaving walking across the Sahara because they need the fresh air, right? It's because their, their countries, their states have made them surplus. And they're trying to find a way of building lives of meaning um, elsewhere. And, you know, another, my country, Kenya, and, and you know, it's true, I talk to people from Ethiopia and I do appreciate that there is a significant difference in the public space that's available in Kenya that versus that's available in Ethiopia. But in Kenya right now, we're in the middle of the worst drought that we've had in the last 10 years. And the state tells us there's no money, there's no money, there's no money. And yet we just got a delivery of, I think, $14 billion worth of weapons from the United States. There's always money for guns. There's never any money for food. There's never any money for education. There's never money for healthcare. There's never money for any of these things. So a lot of this innovation is happening really in response to people realizing that we are creating an exploited underclass, and the exploited underclass needs to figure out how a way to navigate the space that's left. And and technology is one way, which is why to me I have a personal resistance to, um, or I I think net neutrality is a really important <coughs> cause. Because what happens when you create a fast internet for people who can pay and a slow internet for people who can't pay? The internet, open, equal access to the internet is one of the few things right now that is actually equally available to people. Like, yes, you have to pay to get connected. Yes, you have to buy the mobile phone. But once you get connected, me, who is a poor working student, will have the same quality of internet as the person who is loaded and living in their mansion. In Kenya, it's all crappy, but still, you have it on the same, on a similar level. And that's why I, mean, I personally am very opposed to things like Facebook um, basics, because what it's saying is let's give people, poor people a poor version of the internet, and let's give rich people a different version of the internet, which means what? We're having different qualities of public um, um, engagement. So um, I, to me, I think those two things are quite related. Um, and yes, on the, on the point of the Ethiopian, the coverage of the Ethiopian protests, one of the things that I, I, I touched on in my research is internet shutdowns. The reason why governments are learning how to shut down the internet is because they've recognized that there's something happening there. We've had 16 internet shutdowns in Africa in the last uh, year and a half. Um, for the, it's, it's a complicated phenomenon, um, comp not complicated, multi-layered phenomenon, but part of the reason why the Ethiopian protests didn't get coverage is because the Ethiopian government shut down the internet for almost like three months or four months. And a year. Yeah, and social media for almost a year. I think social media just got back online. People were being arrested for Facebook posts and disappeared. I think there was a guy whose family in Addis was arrested for a thing he posted in Australia. Um, and so the, the, the challenge with Ethiopia for me is that the, from my perspective, Ethiopia and Sudan is that the police state is so well developed. And so the obstacle for us as Kenya, our biggest advantage, honestly, is that our government is extremely incompetent. 
That's the greatest advantage that we have, that they don't know, the left hand never knows what the right hand is doing. You don't have that problem. The Ethiopian government, the left hand, always knows what the right hand is doing, and so the space is completely different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any comment? Go ahead. Just briefly, three final points. The model for the future closure of civic space and civil society space is Erdogan's Turkey. That's going to be the model. So you can look forward to the Turkish model variations of that being replicated uh, in Africa. The second point is that one of the things that activists wanting to use electronic means can utilize, but have been very, very slow to utilize, is webcasting. Not just websites, but webcasting, whereby they can broadcast on the web vernacular messaging. Okay, they haven't been doing that. You can go on website after website and country after country. Where is the local content of the vernacular? It's all such a Western, as it were, replication that the message is not getting through to Joe Bloggs in the countryside. Okay, so that's the second point. The third point is that when we look at civic space and protest for the future, and as things shut down and open up in other spheres, the churches and the unorganized churches, the rough and ready churches that we don't think are actually churches, the ones that get charismatic and get the word of God and <laughs> do all kinds of sort of lala glossia and wonderful speaking in tongues, that's going to be the future of citizen mobilization. It may not produce a secular democratic society in the way that we would recognize, but certainly going to create a bit more space than what there is right now. Um, I think are we, we, we're going to have to go to, to, to the last panel. Um, how can Africa claim the 21st century <laughs> entitled <laughs> to <laughs> I think it's a good place to end with a lot of questions and a lot to think about uh, thank you everyone